Hello and welcome to this lecture on vaccine hesitancy and COVID-19. My name is Rachel Garrier and I'm a Hecht Levy postdoctoral fellow at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at Johns Hopkins University. So before diving into the relationship between vaccine hesitancy and COVID-19, I want to first define what vaccine hesitancy is. Um, vaccine hesitancy, defined in the purpose of this presentation, is to delay an acceptance or refusal of vaccination despite the availability of vaccination services. And there are many contributors that form vaccine hesitancy. Um, and many papers like to, much research likes to refer to these as the three C's. The three C's meaning the main three contributors to vaccine hesitancy. Um, first C being complacency, meaning not trusting a vaccine or a provider. The second C being convenience, um, someone's access to vaccines or lack thereof. And lastly, confidence, um, someone who does not necessarily perceive a need or a value for a vaccine will have different hesitancy levels in comparison to others. And so I like to conceptualize vaccine hesitancy as a spectrum, as a continuum. And here you can see an excellent figure um, created by Hannah Henry and presented at a TED Talk um, in Oslo by Tara Hael showing the continuum of vaccine acceptance. So on one end, you have absolute refusers. And on the other hand, you have absolute acceptors. But the reality of the situation is that most of us are somewhere in the middle. And we're going to dive into the specifics of what that means later in the presentation. But it's important to remember that most of us are vaccine hesitant, and that's OK. Um, another important clarification is that vaccine hesitancy does not equal and is not synonymous to anti-vaccination. So as you can see on the spectrum, anti-vaccination is on the spectrum of vaccine hesitancy on one extreme, um, but the terms should not be used interchangeably. So as you can see on this figure, as I said before, most people are vaccine hesitant and that is okay. That is expected as public health professionals. We do not expect the public to automatically um, trust interventions recommended without explanation and education. But with that being said, it's important to differentiate between anti-vaxxers who are a population that generally is hard to engage in conversation and education around vaccines because oftentimes they're not really interested in becoming non-anti-vaxxers. Um, in comparison to those who are vaccine hesitant, most of the population, usually there's room for education and, and discussion and room for impacting um, their vaccination uh, behaviors. Therefore, from a public health perspective, um, investing resources in educating and uh, in educating people and in interventions surrounding com combating vaccine hesitancy um, is what we choose to do, especially in light of COVID-19. Um, bef before diving into the specifics of vaccine hesitancy in light of COVID-19, it's important to differentiate that there are different forms of vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy is very heterogeneous. It's disease dependent. So one may be hesitant toward one vaccine in comparison to another. So a classic explanation is the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine that received awful press um, in the last few decades due to the ex-physician Andrew Wakefield claiming that the MMR vaccine causes autism in children. Of course, this was later proven to be untrue, but trust in vaccines across the public, across all diseases, not just MMR or the vaccine against MMR were impacted. Um, so one may feel different still today because of that lingering impact of Wakefield's false claim regarding the MMR vaccine specifically within children in comparison to their feelings toward the influenza vaccine, which they may not necessarily be afraid of, but they may not necessarily see a large value in vaccinating against influenza due to its inconsistent and relatively low um, effectiveness. 
With that being said, there are lots of benefits to the influenza vaccine that we are not going to get into for the purposes of this talk, but the disease-dependent vaccine hesitancy is very, very important to mention. Um, in addition, vaccine hesitancy is population-dependent. So depending on who I am, I may be hesitant toward vaccines more or less. For example, parents thinking to vaccinate their children may be more hesitant towards vaccines for their children in comparison for themselves. Um, healthcare workers, um, research has shown, and this is my field of research, shows that healthcare workers view vaccines um, in an unexpected way and are actually very hesitant toward vaccines despite maybe some instinctual expectation that healthcare workers would trust vaccines um, more than the general public. Um, but at the end of the day, no matter what population people are included in, they have cross identities. And everyone is a member ultimately at the end of the day of the public. So parents can be healthcare workers. Healthcare workers are part of the public. Parents are part of the public. Um, so people's different identities also impact um, how they are hesitant toward vaccines um, in general and regarding specific vaccines. So how does the concept of vaccine hesitancy integrate itself into COVID-19? Well, as you can see, from, I put on this slide uh, screenshots of headlines um, that we've seen over the last uh, almost year now since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, headlines that worry about mistrust in the coronavirus vaccine, um, the risks of misinformation surrounding the coronavirus vaccine. Um, and so therefore, it's interesting and important to investigate how vaccine hesitancy will take place and personify itself specifically regarding the COVID-19 vaccine that hopefully will be available in the very near future. Um, and despite the world waiting so patiently for the coronavirus vaccine, as you can see in this figure, the University of, of Chicago released data in May of this year, May of 2020, um, showing that not everyone, at least in the United States of the people surveyed, uh, around 1,000 people surveyed, were completely sure that they are planning on getting vaccinated against COVID-19. Um, so overall, less than half. And this has major implications for the control of the pandemic and obviously for vaccine hesitancy as well. So vaccine hesitancy in light of COVID-19 has many different aspects. There's the heroization aspect of the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, the, it's sort of being put on a pedestal. It's the only solution. It's the only way we're going to get over this pandemic. Uh, but what does that mean? Will people actually use the vaccine when it's available? Um, will the vaccine be effective? Will the vaccine be safe? Um, a non-C contributor to vaccine hesitancy is trust. Um, and there are many aspect, ways that trust impacts vaccine hesitancy. So in the case of COVID-19, trust pay, plays a really large role because there is trust in the vaccines itself and trust in the institutions that are recommending the public governments, for example, to use the COVID-19 vaccine. So when institutional and government trust has deteriorated, like we're seeing unfortunately across the world right now, um, we expect that this will impact um, people's belief and trust and hesitancy in the COVID-19 vaccine. And this leads to questions of allocation and justice. So when we're facing reality, we have to remind ourselves that the COVID-19 vaccine could fail to be safe, be developed on time, be available, be used, be effective, be equitably distributed between populations. And what does this mean for vaccine hesitancy? Well, there's a lot at stake. Um, for, first of all, vaccines generally, um, we're already seeing a reemergence of vaccine preventable diseases obviously those who are not COVID, due to the crisis and the stress that COVID-19 has put on healthcare systems in general. Um, so people are not following up with their regular routine immunizations. We're seeing reemergence of previously vaccine preventable, vac vaccine -preventable diseases, such as measles, for example. Um, there's also a lot at stake for public health in terms of public health as a service to, a pub, uh, to the public, um, how public, how public health keeps the public healthy um, against COVID-19 and or prevents COVID-19 um, or generally keeps the public healthy. Um, there's a lot at stake for public health as a profession, as an institution. Um, and finally, this ties into how trust 
um, in vaccines, in public health and institutions as well is on the line here um, in terms of the development and the ultimately allocation and effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccine. So I'll conclude um, with this food for thought. If vaccines are considered to be one of the greatest public health achievements of all time, like many of us in public health and medicine consider them to be, vaccine hesitancy be considered as one of the greatest threats to public health of all time. And uh, vaccine hesitancy's role in the COVID-19 pandemic um, has unfolded a little bit, but has yet to be unfolded fully. And uh, as a greater public health community, we are doing our best to combat it um, the best we can. So thank you very much.